since I was a kid, I wanted to make movies. I love the writing process because you can go anywhere with it. I've always been interested in the acting aspect. I just have like so many stories to tell myself. There's a lot in me, a lot of creativity. I see a lot of things happen in my community that I believe should be spoken about. Many people are going through this every single day. Bullying, poverty, you know, racism. Wake up, people, like something is going on. Every new voice counts and matters. Every idea, every story starts with a spark, a tiny light that glows. But to speak up, to be heard, to innovate, takes courage. We're here to ignite that tiny spark. We're here to foster Canadian voices, our narratives, our ideas. We're here to spark courage. Our logo is a showcase for our culture, our storytellers, our innovators, and it reflects our creators and communities. The spark is a catalyst to push boundaries, to drive the future, and for Canadian voices to be heard on a global stage. everyone and welcome to the future of film showcases in the casting room panel discussion. You are in for a special feature tonight as we hear from these wonderful casting directors. Then a few lucky actors will talk to them one on one in breakout rooms. Of course, this is an industry session um, and it is of course a part of the Future of Film Showcase presented by CBC Gem, streaming now through July 22nd. That's next Thursday. You can watch online for free on CBC Gem today, tomorrow and next week. So don't sleep on this brilliant 2021 selection. Now you may be wondering who this wondrous woman speaking to you is. My name is Samah Ali and I am the FOFS industry director and your moderator for today's conversation. Now, while I may be the one who is on the stage, um, I also want to recognize the heavy lifting done by the FOFS team to put this panel together for without them, we would not be here today. Speaking of where we are today, I would like to take this moment to recognize where FOFS operates year round. The Future of Film Showcase acknowledges our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been taken care by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples, such as current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, uh, an agreement to share and care for the Great Lakes region. Because this is an online event, we understand that this land acknowledgement may differ for some of you who are watching from different parts of Canada. I want to encourage everyone attending today to please get familiar, get aware, and get active in your local community by acknowledging where you are today and whose land you reside on. This is one of the first steps in reconciliation and crucial in understanding your place in Canada's settler colonial nation. 
FOFs would also like to thank our presenting partner, CBC GEM, our public funders, the Government of Canada, Telefilm, and the ArtFest Business Arts Program. FOFs also would like to thank Larissa Mayor Casting for helping put this panel together. She can't be here, but we will miss her dearly. And, you know, without further ado, I want to put a spotlight on the folks who are going to be sharing this proverbial stage with me, Jesse Griffiths, Griffiths, Andrew Deiters, and Sharon Forrest. Over the next 40 or so minutes, we'll speak candidly about their process and advice that they would offer actors. Now, since we only have 40 minutes to chat, I do want to encourage everybody who's streaming in on YouTube to drop their questions in the live chat and I'll be weaving them into the conversation throughout our time together. All right, so we're looking out for those questions. If you don't have them now, just drop them in as, as they come in. Now, with that being said, I want to pass the mic to each casting director to share a little bit about who they are and of course, how they got to where they are today. Sharon, unmute yourself. Let's start with you. Hi. Um, how, well, I guess, how did I get into casting? I would have to say for sure, nepotism. Um, my sister uh, is was a casting director and hired me many moons ago to work with her. And, um, you know, we said, we'll give it three months. If we don't like each other and want to kill each other, we still have to have family dinners together. So let's just call it a quits after three months if it doesn't work out. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, it worked out. So um, I have an English degree in university, so I don't really have uh, a background for casting, but it's it's an interesting thing to become a casting director because what is your background? I mean, a lot of people have theater backgrounds. Some were actors, some have, you know, directing backgrounds, but it's, um, it's kind of learn as you go. And that's sort of how it went for me. So 30 years later, I don't know how many years later, 28 years later, I don't know, it's been a while. <laughs> So that's how I got into casting, and that's who I am. Nepotism. Open the, if that door's open, take it, I say. Just take it. I love your honesty. Love it, Sharon. Jesse, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Um, <laughs> made me laugh. Um, just so you know, my puppy is making a lot of noise right now, so I hope <laughs> you're like serious crashes. Um, I wish I could say nepotism. That's such a good story, Sharon. Uh, I was I was an actor. I, I did that kind of route. So I went to theater school, and then I was I was a working actor in Toronto for the better part of a decade. Uh, film, TV, lots of theater, commercial work. Uh, you know, worked in every single small town across the country, doing all the different theater shows that I love to do. Great stories from that. Uh, but kind of over the course of those 10 years, I, I was lucky enough to have some opportunities come my way, like like Sharon, uh, Jason Knight, a uh, really great casting director, now a friend and mentor of mine, reached out one day and asked if I would be his reader. Uh, and so I was his reader for uh, the better part, uh, well, a couple of months, and then after that became his assistant, and then worked with Jason Knight for a while, and then kind of went back to the acting world because I wasn't fully ready to walk away from it. And then out of the blue, another wonderful woman came to my life, uh, Stephanie Gorin, and uh, you know offered me a job on her team as her associate. And I worked with Stephanie for the better part of two years. Uh, learned a lot from both of them. They both have a, a different approach to casting, but they're both obviously phenomenal at what they do. And I, I learned a lot from them. Uh, and then you know, working with Stephanie, small jobs started to come my way, you know, casting small shorts or indie features. And I was doing those on the side. And eventually those small jobs became bigger and I couldn't do a full time job in a, you know, the, the, the uh, part time casting. And with Stephanie's full support and blessing, I, I went out on my own. And so it's, we're coming up on three years now. So it's it's been an uphill climb, but a lot of a lot of fun along the way. Wow. We're going to get into that. I Definitely. wish that was my story, Jesse. No, yours is funnier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to get Andrew in. Andrew, tell us how you got to where you are today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I think uh, I probably became a casting director uh, equal parts uh, dumb luck uh, because I love I love my job and, and hard work because part of being a casting director is is running a business and, and what comes with that is a lot of a lot of work. Um, how did I start though? I started casting, so I cast uh, strictly commercials. 
Um, but, but I cast uh, union, non-union um, actors, and we specialize in real people casting. So people that you wouldn't typically go to a talent agent to find. Um, and that skill is something I developed when I was working in unscripted television, uh, casting uh, strange and hard to find people like uh, people who believe they were abducted by aliens or um, uh, people who survived a hippo attack in Africa. Um, so these are literally people that I was casting prior to starting Ground Glass. And um, so that skill of being able to find really niche, hard to find people transferred well into commercial casting and finding um, everyone from uh, people who uh, have a uh, physical disability, who use a wheelchair, um, people in indigenous communities that uh, may not have representation um, or might be harder to um, form a relationship of trust with um, and, and, and that type of thing. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Andrew, just a no, quick question. This is just for my fancy. Um, have you ever casted for a reality TV show? I have, yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge reality TV girl, so that makes me very excited. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah um, we, we did some reality TV casting uh, a few years back, so yeah. There's so much to get into that, but I don't want to take up all the time with my interests. Let's get into the conversation. So whoever wants to take this first, um, how do you approach the casting process? Um, I, I think, <laughs> I mean, like it's, big question. It's, a, it's a great question. It's a really good question. I think that, I mean, every single project is entirely different. Every team is different. Um, for me, uh, I think like collaboration, transparency, open communication is like the utmost importance. Uh, but I acknowledge that, you know, uh, the writers and producers and directors that I'm working with have a vision of, of what they want. And, and my job is to kind of service that production. Um, on the same note, I want to challenge them a little bit, too, and be like, I know you think of you want this actor, but what about this actor as well? Um, not all the time and kind of pick and choose those moments, but they're hiring us casting directors for a reason. And it's not just to put, uh, you know, a bunch of self tapes in front of them, but to really curate an experience of people that we're excited about or might not be as known or we think that can do something different. So it's, it's a very, for me, I think probably for everyone here, it's a collaborative and fluid process. Does that make Sharon? any sense? You know, Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> I think Jesse just summed it up. He's much more eloquent than I. Um, yeah, it, it's a lot of it's collaboration. And I, I love working on teams that um, have input to casting. You know, a lot of people have this vision that, oh, the casting director just decides who's going to have, who's going to get everything. It's not like that at all. It is, as you guys know, Andrew and Jesse, like it is one big pool of the network piping in and everybody piping in. So, um, and sometimes that's good. Sometimes, you know, depends, like it's just an interesting process, but I love um, a lot of collaboration. And if anybody's got cool ideas, I'm like, yeah, bring it on. I'll, I'll bring them in. Um, I pre-screen a lot of people. Um, I have with, you know, we don't always, we used to get our directors with us all the time in the room, quite frankly. So um, there was a bit more pressure at some point to hit it right away because you didn't want your director to always sit through a bunch of new people that you didn't know. So sometimes I used to pre-screen before I'd even have my first session, depending on the role. I mean, if it's the, the hitters you know that are gonna get it, that's fine. But what I, um, you know, there's been an upside and a downside not to having your director in there because I've learned so much sitting with incredible directors over my career. It's, that's been a masterclass for me. But, um, but when you're on your own, you know, actors will go be kind of disappointed the director's not there. And I'm like, well, baby, you might not have got a shot if the director was here. So. Um, I tend to pump up my sessions a bit more and see maybe four or five more new people per role than I normally would, even more sometimes. If I'm like, and I can use it as a, as a, a, a screening time to see new talent too when I'm having a session. So um, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling now, but yeah, that's kind of my process. And, um, but Jesse said it in a better way, I liked his. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have too, too much more to add to that. I mean, I think uh, as Jesse pointed out, and this is part of what makes uh, my job so much fun is that every job is different. 
Um, and it is a collaborative process. So you, you work with so many different individuals, uh, some of whom you might not jam with uh, or gel with too well. And, and the beauty of commercials is that it's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, and then others that you really enjoy working with. Um, but as far as the, the approach goes, um, when I'm casting performers for commercials, you know, if it's if it's wall to wall dialogue or if it's comedy, um, that requires a lot more in terms of um, knowing talent from before and also seeing the potential in new talent that you haven't seen before. So knowing which agents to go to uh, for for performers that can can pull off that type of work. Um, and also, you know, I'll go as far as, as looking at not just self tapes and stuff, but looking into CVs and see where people have trained and, and the sort of background that they have and what other credits do they have, uh, which can be a lot when we're reviewing hundreds, if not thousands of submissions. Um, but it's an important step to take in my, in my opinion. Yeah. Andrew, I want to hold it on you and ask the next question. When you are searching for actors, how do you know what you're searching for and what do you look for? And then in addition to that, how do you navigate when they are in union or not in union, or as you mentioned earlier, just a regular lay person? Right. So, I mean, um, as far as union and non-union goes, uh, Union performers can't audition, cannot audition for non-union, whereas non-union can audition for union. However, we have to give preference of engagement. I, I'm not sure about the, the long format world, but in the commercial world, we have to give preference of engagement to union members before there would be a reason to permit a non-union member and give that person the opportunity. Um, Oh, sorry, what was the other part of your question? <laughs> when you're casting, what are you looking for? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, range, uh, the ability, maybe not in the init initial um, session process, because right now uh, we're, we're basically doing casting by self-tape, not bringing people into our studios. Um, but really the ability for a performer to interpret script um, and bring something, in some cases, you know, depending on the job, something fresh to be the script, but not too off script. Um, you know, uh, improv improv has a seat at the table for certain jobs, but definitely not all, especially in the uh, in the commercial world. Um, and uh, yeah, performers that, of course, when we do call them back, that can take direction, that understand direction. Um, and, and subtle cues, whether it's it's you know it's a big a big adjustment from a casting director or a small adjustment. If performers can take adjustment to begin with, um, that's a good sign. Um, you know, if if there's a, if there's a one tone throughout the the, the, the session, um, or after multiple multiple takes, not a good sign. Um, so yeah, that kind of is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Jesse, what about you? What do you look for when you're casting? This is such a big question. <laughs> um, I'm hitting you all today. <laughs> good. I mean, it comes up. Um, I, I mean, Andrew kind of touched on it as well. I think that I think like the two things I want to look for is like one that an actor kind of knows what their role is in in the world, what in the in the, the story. You know, sometimes you have people who are reading for the barista and they think that they're reading for Hamlet, and so it's important to know that even if it's a small role, like it's still pivotal and you're there to serve that part of the story. So it's important to kind of know your place in that sense. The flip side on that is I also, I wanna see actors who bring choices uh, based upon like their artistic abilities and their thoughts and how they interpret text and where they think the story might go. I think sometimes the uh, actors can fall in the trap of, of showing, casting what they think we want to see versus show us what we are capable of. Because I can see someone who might make really interesting choices that might not be right, but then I can play with that versus someone who just kind of comes and does the first choice that came to mind and then it's me trying to get to the place of so that's something interesting. And I want to see what you can do. Like, actors are truly artists, so let's see how you interpret the text in, you know, knowing tone, rhythm, cadence, like the world of the script, and then like come in and play. Like that's what I'm kind of looking for. Sharon, same question. Once again, those guys are going to say it better than I did. But um, <laughs> I think Jesse, what Jesse just really hit upon, and, and so did Andrew, is it's really important to come in with a choice. And um, I always say, I, I usually say at the beginning of the audition, just 
give me what you got. Let's see what you have out of the gate. And then, then we'll fool around with it and adjust. But another thing that they pointed in, know what you're auditioning for. You know, are you auditioning for a show on YTV? Are you show, doing an NBC show? And research the show if you can, so you know the tone. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I've honestly had actors the odd time come in for like, or, or vice versa, a comedy or a drama and they'll go is, and it'll be a serious thing and they'll go, is this a comedy? And you'll sit there going, wow, did you even, you know, try to research it if you can. Now it's hard on a pilot, but you can kind of research the filmmakers and ask your agent if you're, if you're unaware of what's going on, just say, it, can you tell me a bit more about this show? So I like to know that I feel like an actor that comes in a little informed as opposed to someone who just kind of blows in and kind of goes, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm, I'm right with those guys where you make a choice, whether it's right or wrong, and then we know we can direct. Um, and as I said before, we always, and we still sometimes get our directors in the room, which is a blessing. And I'm, I'm loving it when we always do that because, you know, they know what they're doing, but if not, we're doing it. And so we have to make sure that the person that we put on set, the director can work with and give direction to and move it around. So that is very important. So let's talk about self tapes real quick. Um, I know that in a COVID environment, everybody is sending in their tapes at home. So how do you get that feel of the range of a person when usually you do have that organic um, conversation beforehand, seeing who they are as a person, their personality, and then them getting into character. Um, that's question number one. Question number two is when you're doing the self tape at home, should you have props like a glass of wine or a broom for something, you know, like just different things? Jesse, I see you're already unmuted, so go for it. I did that by accident. Um, <laughs> I was I was writing down your questions because I always forget the second question. Um, so turn two. Uh, I mean, we can talk about. I feel like self tapes could be an entire workshop. Like we really could go into it. I think that people are you know hesitant about about self tapes and kind of get their back up about it, which I do too because I would much rather like Sharon be in the room with an actor and be able to work around. Like that's the fun stuff. Um, but the flip side of it with the self tape, especially now is like Sharon said, like I'm seeing a lot more people via self tape because I can, and I have time. So I'm able to see, like take chances on some new talent because it doesn't cost studio time or, or director time or anyone else, but with my time, which I'm happy to do, I'm, I'm super aware that every time I put out a self tape, it is putting a huge onus on the actor to find space in their apartment to kick their partner out to you know to take time out of their day every time it's a lot of work but it's an opportunity to present a polished piece of work which you know sometimes I mean, when i was acting you know in auditions i would get nervous and i would fumble my lines or make a huge fool of myself and with self tapes you can take a bit more control over the work you're presenting um what you don't want to do is work something to death where we can tell it's the 20th time you've worked on it because after take three or four, I find it can lose some of the edge and become a bit soft. So like in a typical audition, I want to see people like coming in and making, making some choices. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, you, other cast and directors, and I've said it before, you can tell in the first 30 seconds, 45 seconds or whatever their time is. And so there is some truth to that because you can tell if someone feels grounded in that world that they feel comfortable and if you've got to get excited about what they're going to do next. Um, so that's my thing on self tape. It's a love hate for a lot of people. I think that right now self tapes are going to be here for a while. They're not going anywhere. Uh, so I think it's a medium that we have to really kind of embrace and, and take ownership over it. Um, in terms of props, like I'm for props as long as it doesn't distract, as long as it's only there to support um, just being very careful of what the prop is. You know, if you are a doctor or a lawyer or a police officer and you can hold a pad of paper and a pen, great. I find that sometimes with younger actors, a prop grounds them, just gives them something to focus on, but props can also be distracting. So I would always say in a self tape, go back and watch. I mean, you should always go back and watch your self tapes, but if the prop is becoming, if the prop is more exciting than you are, then you have a problem. <laughs> so just focus on what the, what the purpose the prop is serving. Thanks, Jesse. Um, Andrew, how do you work with the self tape when you are casting more for commercials? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, self, self tapes, I think, uh, to Jesse's point, they're, they're here to stay indefinitely. Um, collectively, commercial casting directors in Toronto have agreed to reopen our facilities as of tomorrow with stage three um, for in person recalls only and only for essential reasons. So essential reasons would be chemistry uh, tests, wall to wall dialogue. Um, some significance with props like working with power tools or food or, or skin cream or something like that um, where lighting is important. Um, so self tapes are here to stay. How I work with them in the commercial world is, I mean, it's, we review hundreds of them a week, if not thousands. Um, to Jesse's point, you know, you can, you can really tell, I would even say like 15 seconds, you know, uh, depending on, on what the job is and what the ask is of the performer or person. Um, you can really get a sense of someone quickly. Um, props as well, to Jesse's point, as long as they're not distracting. The same thing for wardrobe. We don't want to see someone that's gone completely uh, catastrophic with, war with wardrobe choices and wearing like a fur coat when they're supposed to be playing the doctors. I don't know. But um, the, yeah, as far as how I work with them, um, that's kind of in a nutshell. Uh, agents, it's in, in the commercial world, it's the agent's responsibility to convey the self-tape request to their talent. So a good agent will do that properly and give the talent a clear direction on what they should do. From a technical point of view, it's not that, um, it's, it's not that complicated. I think a lot of performers at the start of the pandemic were overthinking the technical elements of a self tape and getting a backdrop and making sure that there was lighting and all this stuff. For me, it's in the eyes. So make sure you've got good light on your face. Um, and I'm far more concerned with what you're doing than the fact that there's a cat walking around in the background or whatever else. Just don't do self tapes in the bathroom. That's all I ask. Speaking of cats, you're probably going to start hearing mine soon because it's close to feeding time. But we move. We truly do move. I There are a lot of questions in from the audience, all talking about new talent, how to pitch yourself to casting directors, when casting directors you know, experiment with new talent, how to bring them in. Sharon, this is going to be a question for you. How do you navigate bringing in new people into the world of casting? Um, well, I guess that goes back to the self tape. To be honest, I do Zoom sessions. So I don't actually, my Zoom sessions are big. So I'm not, I don't, um, I may be a little bit different from these guys. I don't request self tapes unless an actor will say they can't come in because of a conflict or something. So, um, so therefore, I I do spend a bit of money in the casting room because I still have casting central <laughs> taping and doing stuff for me. But um, so I do, that's how I, I just see new talent. I just see if, if, as I say, if my director is not there and some, some of our Zoom sessions, we do have our directors in. So um, it just depends. So as far as new talent, quite honestly, I work a lot on the casting workbook and the actors will have a little video with them. Sometimes they'll just have a little clip of something they've done. And I watch those all the time for new talent. I will watch those. My, the caveat is be careful what you put up. Feel really good about that little clip because sometimes I'm like, I think I'll bring that person. Oh, they have a clip. I'll look at it and I'll go, ooh, not bringing that person in. So, or I'll go, that clip was great. I'm gonna bring that person in. So be careful. You know, maybe you want to discuss with your agent before you put up a little clip, but that's how I do a lot of my stuff. I, um, I go on my gut, like I'm sure you guys do, and I look at their training a lot. I skip right down to training usually if it's a new person and um, it might be a look that I need to, right? So, um, and I do watch the little clips. I, I find them really helpful for me. So that. Did that answer it? Oh, and the props? Yes, oh, I'm with the props with those. Oh, no, that was the last question. Sorry. <laughs> no, but glad to know that you love the props. I do have a follow up question for you, Sharon, or actually anybody who does want to jump in. Um, what about if somebody does not have an agent? Um, they are really interested in getting into acting, but they maybe have one course underneath their belts. How do you navigate that? Is it still a developing process? Would you recommend for them to continue working? or are you willing to take a chance? 
sometimes if they're recommended to me. I mean, I don't, I don't usually get people that suggested to me that don't have agents, to be honest, um, because I work on, I don't know, on the union shows on the casting workbook. So I might not be the best example of somebody who does. The odd person doesn't have an agent or an agent will call me saying, I'm thinking of taking this person on. I really like them. Do you have any time in your session to see them today? Or I'm not today, but in whenever I have my session and I'll pop them in, uh, especially, you know, if I, I trust the agent's taste and everything. So probably I'm not the best person to chat about people that don't have agents because I don't I don't deal with them as much unless Andrew's somebody unmuted. brings it to me. Come through, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I just it's a fun, it's kind of a funny topic because we just started a ground glass casting TikTok account last week and we posted a couple of videos, one of one of which might have gone a little bit viral. Um, well, I don't know if it's viral in the TikTok world, but it's like 50,000 views or something overnight, which was, I think, impressive. But the, the, the problem with, with that was that I think people misunderstood, and I think this is quite common for people to misunderstand that casting directors are not casting agents, nor are we talent agents. So while we might know who to go to in terms of talent or agents to go to for their talent, we do not keep a roster of talent ourselves. So for people that are not represented, I mean, you can apply through, you know, although I, I don't know the, the reputation of casting calls that are seen on places like Mandy might not be that great in some cases. Um, you, can, you can apply for um, casting calls through many casting directors, Facebook pages or Facebook groups that are open um, I mean, I'm speaking for the commercial world right now, but um, so that's one way. And I will also say that, you know, um, for anyone that's looking to get an agent, you should really do your research because there are some, to be candid, scumbag agents <laughs> um, who will not represent you well, who will not communicate with you well or communicate with the casting director well. Um, and so you should really try to avoid uh, those individuals. But yeah, it's, um, I think in the commercial world, just quickly, it's a great time for people who um, are new. And I'll also say that in regard to diversity, um, clients and uh, agencies and directors are willing to take uh, much bigger risks now to allow for diversity in commercials than before. And that's for all the right reasons. Um, so I think that that's something to keep in mind as well for anyone who's aspiring and um, from the BIPOC community. Thanks for that. I actually want to now open that up to a little more of an interesting question on the business side. Um, obviously, being a casting director, you do have to work in the casting world, but also you have to be a business owner running management and being able to hire employees and doing HR. What is that process like and how do you balance between the two at the same time? Jesse, I haven't heard from you in a while, so why don't you take it? Oh my goodness. Uh, you know what? It's, it's actually, it's, uh, it's what I love about this job. I, I really do. Like it's equal parts like artistic and working with actors and reading scripts, but I do love the idea of taking a sense of ownership over what I'm doing. Uh, and, and a lot of it has been reaching out to like colleagues and mentors and, and like, like Stephanie Gordon and Jason Knight and, and others who have helped me along the way and just asking a lot of questions. Um, but also figuring out how to properly do my taxes and how to write contracts and hire employees and knowing that there's only so much, like, there are things I'm good at and there are things I'm not good at. So I, you know, I, I ask my HR friends you know what's a, what does a good contract look like or i hire a, a proper accountant and make sure i don't owe you know thousands of dollars in taxes i think it's good to know what your limitations are but also you know a lot of the work that i have that i have gotten has been through you know social media and 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 i don't want to say branding i just don't like that term but you know the the work you put out there um and kind of looping back on the idea of non-union or uh, actors without agents type thing but a lot of the work i'd say half the work we do is specifically looking for unrepresented talent from like marginalized communities that haven't had the opportunity to get an agent and when we start doing that work that work attracts more work because there are other people who want to work on those type of projects so 
they they are not fifty million dollar Hollywood blockbusters, but the scripts are really good and the teams are really passionate. Uh, and those are people I want to kind of collaborate with um, because I, I believe in the product. And you know, in ten years down the line, maybe they'll have that fifty million dollars, then we can really talk. Um, but I do I, I enjoy the process. It's it can be a bit daunting, um, you know, knowing right now that I've got you know a couple of staff that are working with me and their livelihood is dependent upon the work that I bring in. That's stressful. Um, but it also motivates me to make sure that I'm doing my job as efficiently as I can and, and you know, always looking for that, that next job. And like acting, uh, it, it is about connections and who you work with. And it, you're kind of, for me, it's like you're only good as your last job. So you always have to be making sure that you're doing you know, the best you can all the time. Because, I mean, right here, there are two incredibly qualified casting directors and there are so many in this city that, you know, that Toronto is not like yearning for more casting directors, like, you know, where there are so many talented people already working. So you got to make sure that you're competitive. I'm rambling. I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. <laughs> you answered it perfectly. And we're actually within our last five minutes. So I do want to actually ask quite a big question that I thought was very pertinent from one of the audience members. It was about social media and um, specifically um, somebody asked if there were any tips that um, you folks would recommend to properly utilize your social media presence and platforms towards your advantage in the industry? Anyone take Andrew? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question uh, that's come up on um, on a few occasions now. And I think it's interesting. It's, it's your brand to Jesse's point. You know, I have ground glass casting. I have a, you know, ground glass casting, Facebook page, Instagram page, uh, now a TikTok account. Very excited about that. I have no idea how to use it. Um, but, but I think, I think what's important is, you know, be careful with what you post. Um, in the commercial world, I'm finding more and more will be in the middle of a callback session and someone from the agency will be creeping the performer's Instagram page and find something that they don't like or find something that they do like. So that's something to be careful of. I would also say um, just on a personal level, because social media is so time consuming to draw a line somewhere with yourself as to where what you want to, what platform you want to utilize for what. So I'm fortunate in that I have a full-time social media manager and moderator, but I also, you know, I don't spend any time on the, as far as vetting things, I look at the ground glass casting page, but I don't interact with people there. I don't accept friend requests from performers on Facebook. Um, I, I use Facebook for friends and family and clients of mine. Um, but so just, yeah, I think it's important just from a work-life personal balance to, to be weary of that as well. I totally agree. Anybody want to add to that one? And I think Andrew said it perfectly. I think that uh, I have friends who are actors and then so that that gets a bit muddy, but I, I feel guilty if someone messages me, I don't respond back, but I, but it, there are thousands of actors in Toronto. There's only one of me and one of Sharon and one of Andrew. So it, it is hard to, manage that work-life balance. So I think uh, just be aware of, of how you are using that social media to, to reach out and to connect and to, you know, be in employment. Absolutely. We're in our final minute. So I do want to leave you folks with the opportunity to say a little bit more about how people can connect with you in the future. Sharon, haven't heard your voice. I'm missing it desperately. Let us know where people can connect with you online. 1-800, no. <laughs> Connect with me online? Like in what sense? <sighs> Just out of curiosity. <laughs> what, are, what are you talking to online? Um, the thing is I keep, a, I mean, I have a few friends that are actors, but usually my, my relationship with actors are through their agents and then I see them in the room. So when you say, how do people, in what sense do you mean, how would they connect with me online? What is the best way for people to be able to follow your work, be able to keep up with um, different teams that you might be working with, or even the opportunity of people in the room being able to get into the room? Get into the room, get some good training. You know, 
do your homework, do your stuff. That's how you get into and in, get, you know, get out there. I, I, before COVID, um, Susan and I went to a lot of theater too. So um, we're big theater goers. So uh, that was a great way to see performers. And um, so at that, as far as connection, I would say, don't call me, I'll call you. No, <laughs> no, but I, I, if people, if agents can send me things about their performers they like and stuff, but I don't usually have a lot of, go on to IMBD to see what I'm up to. I guess maybe I'm a bit quieter in that, that sense of I'm not like, hey, on TikTok or, you know, Instagram and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not per se, Susan and I aren't quite like that, but um, I know it's a big thing now, but um, yeah, I mean, people always go, how do I rise up? How do I meet you? And it's like, I'll get to know you if you're good. I will. We just will, you know, okay. trust me. There's always room for good actors, way more in the city. Bring it on. Don't worry, we'll find you. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, echoing what, what Sharon said to a degree, I think, um, you know, and back to the, I don't accept friend requests or from, face, uh, from actors on Facebook. I, I do have friends who are performers as well, but. I don't, you know, I get, I get messages all the time after this infamous TikTok video, there were 20 emails this morning asking me if I would consider representing these people. And again, I'm not a talent agent. Um, I would say, you know, follow, follow Ground Glass Casting on Facebook, follow Ground Glass Casting on Instagram. If you have an Instagram account, we post anything that is public and open to submissions there. If you don't have an agent, seek one out. Uh, you can also get an actor's access account through Breakdown Services and submit yourself to projects, which we sometimes we post on uh, actor's access uh, as well. And I would also say that, you know, I think these are great forums for discussions with casting directors, but I think that performers are aspiring. Aspiring performers should seek out mentors who are performers. It's a no brainer. And I think Jesse made that point earlier, you know, there's it's a collaborative industry that we're in, thankfully. Um, I reached out to Jesse a few months ago because someone inquired about casting a long format, which I'm not familiar with. So we had a, a great discussion uh, about that. So seek out mentors or, or people that you can discuss your career goals with who have a great history. They don't have to be famous. They have to be someone you respect and admire who does good work. Mm -hmm. Jesse, can I call you Andrew sometime? <laughs> Absolutely, let's chat, Sharon. Eight hundred, Andrew. <laughs> let's have a cocktail. <laughs> um, no, I mean Sharon and summed up perfectly. I am on Instagram and and TikTok and Twitter and Facebook, and we have a website. And now I have like younger people who can help me with that stuff because I don't know how to use TikTok either. Uh, but it seems like it's a it's it's a thing. So um, thanks to my assistant Leah who does our TikTok account. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I want to thank all three of you in the room, and of course, Carmel on the interpreter <laughs> on the interpretation. She's killing it today. <laughs> Um, and I also want to thank everybody at home for your patience with this panel. We're a little bit over time, but it's okay. We had fun. Um, reminder that we are streaming Fox through July 22nd on CBC Gem. And if you want to find out more about the industry sessions, you can go on to fofs.ca. You'll be able to find out more about industry there. For the actors that are ready to connect with these casting directors, you are now welcome to join the Zoom session. We'll get you loaded in just a little bit. And for YouTube, we're going to sign off. Thank you again, everyone in the room. It's been a lovely time. What a wonderful Bye. job. Thank you. You're a great moderator. Thank you. Yeah, you were great. <laughs> Thank you.